What was the most surprising thing you guys learned when you became like a high-level studio executive? You know, the passions and emotions, uh, you know, in the movie business have always been, um, you know, pretty intense. And, uh, and that's probably only gotten greater today. The stakes seem to be so high. And, um, and so it really creates, um, you know, I just think a, a tremendous amount of pressure on everybody involved uh, uh, in it. And so, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're behind the camera, front of the camera, sitting at a desk, either side of that desk. Hmm. Is it different when you're, you're directly responsible to stockholders? I mean, is the pressure greater? than it is for another executive. You mean like as opposed to Rupert Murdoch? Just for instance, no, relative to that, it's probably easier. <laughs> so Jim, how, how, how is it? What has surprised you? I think, uh, I think what Jeffrey referred to is, is, um, is an interesting aspect of it, the complexity, the nuance of it the randomness of how movies come together, yeah. that collision of molecules that makes a movie and the surprising things that, um, see, that become easy and the things that become difficult and how, you know, how surprising those issues are. You know, such at the as? Other end, well, such as you know, on the other end of that ringing telephone is your worst nightmare or your greatest surprise. And what's and, the worst nightmare? You know, somebody didn't come out of the trailer. Somebody you opened to twelve dollars. You, know, you opened to twelve dollars, or the tracking was completely and totally wrong, or you know, whatever. You know. Nobody, nobody showed up. Yeah, right. Is that There's the nothing. Is that sure. The worst? Yeah. Yes. And th those things yeah, are more. That's pretty you know, bad. Yeah. Interestingly, the, the distribution and marketing issues are more predictable than the production issues. You know, you do have a little bit of runway because you do have research and you do have some sense of you know, the anticipation of a film. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, it keeps life interesting. Donna, what's been your best and worst moment on the job? Um, well, the, I mean, to, to echo what these guys are saying, the best moment is when you have a film work that um, exceeds ex expectations. What so, was the single one that really... Well, there have been a couple, actually, along the way. Yeah. But, um, you know, at Universal specifically, Mamma Mia was a, was a great moment, I think, in the, country's, in the company's history. It's, it is the company's most profitable film. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete surprise. I mean, it went from, you know, being a, well, maybe it'll work internationally in Sweden yeah. to, you know, being a, a, huge, yeah. a huge worldwide hit. And then, of course, this year with, with Ted. Um, which was a film that we greenlit under the supposition that it would do what, you know, the majority of our R-rated comedies do. You know, we have a lot of experience there. And, you know, if it did, if it did you know, 80 to 100 domestically and 40 internationally, yeah. we'd be great. You know, we'd be, we'd be getting a, a decent return on our investment. And so, you know, the, re the fact that it's, um, it's doing what it's doing is, is great. And you, you don't plan for those things. You can't predict them. And they really are a surprise. So, you know, when a surprise like that happens to the positive, it's, yeah. it's really great. And on the other hand, what's been the single worst moment? Um, the single worst moments are all around the failure of any, you know, of any movie. And, um, you know, this year specifically, you know, I'll air my dirty laundry, <laughs> it's no secret, was Battleship. And I think this summer, in terms of the sort of the surprises, when I took the job, I, it wasn't a surprise. I knew I was coming into the job at maybe one of the hardest times in, in you know, in, in certainly in recent history. Um, but the volatility in the business, the volatility in the marketplace has been, um, you know, it's been not, again, not really a big surprise, but it is something that uh, is just a constant challenge to deal with. And, and I think, you know, Battleship was a film that got stuck right in the middle of that. If this, this summer we saw it time and again, if, they, if the audience wasn't interested, they just weren't coming. They weren't coming. And it's it always hard when a movie doesn't movie. work because there's so many yeah. people who invested so much time and energy. It's not like on that one people didn't do necessarily do right, their jobs exactly. well. Right, exactly. No, everybody but thought they were making something great. There's so many elements that come together or don't when a movie works or doesn't work. And that is the hardest part is at times when you're, you put that much work and energy and your staff is rallied to it and then nobody shows up. And then rallying people onto the next one. Because and you have that no is, control over that. Um, 
you have some amount of control, but then there are those extremes, sometimes to the good, as Donna said. I think with us, it was Paranormal Activity, where it came out of nowhere. It was a movie that we had owned for several years and talked about whether to release or not, whether to remake it or not. We started on 13 screens at midnight, right? That was how that came about. So there are times where you really don't know, but then you capture something. And then there are other times where you put all this time and energy investment into something and nobody cares. That is where it's really hard. Do you get some of the Redstone calling and saying, <clears throat> what the hell were you thinking? Or the opposite? Not that polite. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Um, again, I think it is, He's been around the business, movie business his whole life, so he understands the volatility of it. I think it is, instead, when you get a surprise um, in terms of a movie you don't expect. Or a movie like True Grit, which was not a movie yeah. that the Coen brothers certainly hadn't had giant financial success. The movie was a Western. There hadn't been a Western breakout to that kind of level. So it is at times where the shock of saying, wow, who thought that the movie could gross that much money? And those are certainly the good calls. Rob, what's been the biggest challenge for you? I mean, you've left the classic studio world, created a whole new company. What was the single biggest challenge you faced? Well, uh, wait, you mean Rob Friedman or Rob Yeah, Moore? they're Rob Friedman. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Pretty much getting up every morning. No, 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 I'm not uh, telling you something you don't know. Uh, yes, <laughs> the, uh, uh, listen, I think the challenge was trying to convince the, uh, at the time, the, the, uh, the business world, the Wall Street world, that there was a possibility of a different model. Uh, you know, a studio that, that didn't have the, the legacy issues that studios tend to have because they've been around so long and they've been so successful and they weather all the storms of our business. So to try to, uh, ed, to you know, inform that group of people who had to put their money down uh, and take that risk that there was the possibility of building a new mechanism. I mean, uh, more, more currently, what's, what's it like been marrying Summit and Lionsgate? I mean, how's that process? It's good. It's all been great. I mean, we had very similar cultures, uh, even though Lionsgate uh, is a public company. Uh, both had very independent thinking. Both had the same international business model. Um, been friends with the management of Lionsgate for years. And, uh, and so it was, it was uh, you know, they're never seamless because, unfortunately, when you combine two companies, there's always, you know, people that, uh, that don't uh, stay. Um, so it's never fun in that regard, but um, it was, uh, I thought, um, you know, very seamless. And the way we did the transaction, um, it's sort of, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of transactions tend to take longer, so they close later. So there's a lot of conversation about how you merge the two entities prior to the end date. Ours was different in that the transaction occurred that day. Right. And then after that, it was about combining the two companies. So. Um, Speak of, of, of uh, uh, transitions, obviously you've made a transition to Fox. Well, we haven't uh, made it yet, so... What was thinking behind uh, that? We uh, are... still time. Um, <laughs> still time. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> my mother, my father. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we still have uh, uh, one more great release to go with uh, Paramount, who's done a fantastic job for us for seven years. We've probably had one of the most extraordinary track records uh, uh, in our partnership with them. But I think for the next phase of DreamWorks, um, you know, we have ambition to build the company into more businesses uh, uh, and um, really have, a, I think, a broad view of an entertainment, of a family entertainment company. And I think the uh, resources and the assets uh, at Fox uh, and News Corp um, will be better suited for us to sort of achieve that next set of goals. And it's not something that Viacom really felt that um, they had the bandwidth to do. What did you envision in the long term? Because you're expanding into China. What's, where do you see yourself in 10 years? As I say, I think a, a family branded entertainment company that's uh, in you know, many related businesses. We have made it, uh, you know, we've talked a good deal about wanting to start a branded channel on a worldwide platform. That's a high priority uh, for us. Uh, our business opportunities in China, which is a place where News Corp has been very 
um, uh, ambitious with also. So there's a lot of places where we have alignments, um, I think, going forward that are beyond the movie business itself. Does that include live action films? Yes, because of the acquisition of classic media uh, and what is now a pretty vast library of titles, um, we really do want to now uh, sort of move into, you know, getting value out of those. And interestingly, we have them with people spread around this entire table here. So we have Casper with Universal, which uh, we actually are anxious to reboot. And we have Masters of the Universe with Sony. And uh, 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 MGM uh, has got Where's Waldo. And Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger is being done at Disney. And we're just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll produce those movies with the studios? Some of them we will. Some of them, you know, are pre-existing deals. But going forward, that would certainly be our, our Were you goal. you tempted to sell the company? No. Because? I think our best years are ahead of us. And honestly, I'm sure everybody around this table loves what they do. I would argue I have the best job of anybody. Mm. Why? Uh... I love making these movies. I have a wonderful company of 2,400 artists who, um, you know, are incredibly, incredibly passionate about their work and coming to work. You know, you've been on our campus. You know that there's something very unique and wonderful about it. And, uh, you know, I think in this day and age, you either want to be a huge company with vast resources or something that's personal. And um, I've been in the vast companies, and that's exciting. But for me, at this point in my career and what I want to do for the next 10 years, having it be as personal as this is, is what makes it rewarding. Do, do you ever miss the political world? Because you've been very involved with supporting Obama, and you came from politics. I'm not sure I've gotten that far away from the political <laughs> world. <laughs> it's hard, hard to be yeah. more in it than, than, than recently. So. But you've gone back into it and support. I'm just wondering, because you came from that when you were very young. I've never left it. It's always been a very important part of, you know, there are sort of, you know, in the, in the world of things for me that interest me, excite me, engage me, and get me up every day and going, you know, I love my work. Uh, I love politics. I love, you know, philanthropy. Those are sort of the three things. And, you know, I try and go at each of them, you know, 110%. If you weren't studio executives, what would you do? Rob Moore. <laughs> totally unrelated uh, field. <clears throat> um, well, my dream when I was a kid was to become a sports announcer. So I think I've missed that. Um, but I certainly enjoy the entertainment field. Sports certainly is the most adjacent, so I could definitely see myself doing something in the, in the sports world. Mm. Rob Friedman, how about you? Uh, you mean on a go-forward basis, probably? Well, yeah, my guess. But well, if, I mean, if I wanted, to, as a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist, but then I realized <laughs> you had to go to school, so it didn't really work out too well. But, um, but um, you know, philanthropy is very exciting to me now. I'm, I'm very uh, active in that when I'm not, you know, 100% working, and I also have four children, so it <laughs> keeps me busy yeah. too. So, Donna? I think I would, my, you know, my husband's an interior designer, so um, I think I would, I would love to, to uh, develop a high-end hotel, high-end oh, wow. sort of unique wow. hotel properties around the world. That'd be interesting. That sounds interesting. Can I get a discount? I think I might email text him that right now. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Michael? Well, I really loved hearing you say that because I really think our business is different from other businesses in that it's really personal. Mm. And that, you know, I'm tired of people telling me this is business, it's not personal, it's all personal. And I think the fact that we do have the best jobs in the world and we all love our jobs. And I, I have always been enamored of films and it's all about the films and the filmmakers. I, I think that I was one of those people that maybe strive to be an artist but knew there was no way I was gonna pull that off, so that what I would do is serve the artist. And so that's always been fulfilling for me. But I think a lot of us, when we're kids, you know, movies provided something for us. Maybe we didn't like ourselves so much, we found life a little boring, and we 
these films kind of enlarged us and made us into bigger people. You know, we don't want to be diminutive or common. And, and to me, that's how it all started when I was a little kid, when I went to see Real Bravo when I was five or whatever it was. Well, <clears throat> I started out wanting to be a musician at one point, and uh, also a fireman at one point. <laughs> I, I wanted to be a fireman. Me Honestly, too. when that? I was six years <laughs> old, that's it. They you're were heroes. You're putting out fires yeah. all the time. I exactly. wanted to be a fireman. I actually did. Um, I had a little, my fire boots, a little fire hat. So, yeah. So, um, but what was interesting was when I took my oldest daughter around to colleges um, and heard, you know, people talk about the curriculum of the various schools, and I thought about how much time I wasted in college not learning things which seemed incredibly fascinating to me now. Architecture, history, antiquities, art, all of those subjects which I dabbled in, I would want to dive into. And um, certainly philanthropy and uh, music, art, history, those would be things that would fill my life. So I think I would just enjoy doing that. Being a scholar. Yeah. And um, I mean, for decades, Hollywood has been obsessed with awards. And the public has been obsessed with awards. And, you know, very simply, why do awards matter so much, you know, in this day and age? And I'm, sh you know, different people here are going to have different perspectives. So, oh, I, 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 let me just say, I came to Hollywood, I was 23 years old, from New York. There are two things. The dream as a young kid starting out in this business, was to own a house in Malibu on the beach and to win an Academy Award. <laughs> that's it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, those are the dreams. Mm -hmm. As a 23 year old, that's what I aspire to. One was the fantasy of, you know, beach blanket bingo or whatever, <laughs> you know, the good life. That was the representation like of winning, right? That was the representation of yeah. uh, what Charlie Bluthorn used to call the Bank of America Award, right? right. right? And, uh, and the other side of it was the achievement of something great in the eyes of your peers. Right. Right. And the Academy Awards, were then and are today, irrespective of anything else in terms of what they are for the outside world, for our community, they are the pinnacle of success. They are about achieving excellence in the eyes of people who know. Right, right. It's what they do for a living. So it's not a public contest. And that's always the yin yang that it gets so caught up in, which is, is this, is this about the way our customers see our business, or is it about the way we see ourselves? Does uh, everyone else agree with that? Or how well, I think, you know, in the independent world, uh, awards like the Academy Awards can make the difference between profit loss. Mm -hmm. And that's what will make a movie distinctive in the eyes of the public mm -hmm. by knowing that it has that stamp of approval from the industry. Like this year we have movies like Michael Haneke's Amour or Rust and Bone by Jacques Audiard. It's going to be awards recognition that will bring those films the attention they deserve. And uh, we then, love the Michael, Academy Awards because they but, do that. But Michael, yeah. that's the way you look at the Academy Awards as business. Yeah. And for sure they have become valuable yeah. in that Whatever that, whoever wins that Academy Award, that movie now has a, an actual incremental value that's meaningful and some could be, you know, huge in this. But the other is, is the achievement itself in terms of doing something excellent. That's, you had, you wanted that house in Malibu in the Academy Award. I wanted to live in New York coming from Texas and my mother to see me at the Academy Award. <laughs> so, but that's the what? same You know, thing. The, the interesting <laughs> though is there are times when we don't agree with the result of the Academy Awards, and I'm wondering if you get emotional. Pretty much every time. I, don't, I can't remember the time. <laughs> if we don't win, we definitely don't I mean, agree. That's the, you, you, you look back at Gandhi winning instead of E.T., and in retrospect, it's, it's shocking. And I'm wondering how most he caught. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing. Okay. Here's the thing. Both of them were. Yeah, yeah. So and the, I, the Academy Awards, as far as the nominations are concerned, yes. they've been very, uh, uh, they've had a lot of integrity and across all lines that, that, that don't pay attention to commerce and so forth. I think if you, 
yes, there are many years when the best film doesn't meet, win, but it's almost irrelevant, you know? Well, who it, determines you know? the best film? Yeah, the yeah. yeah. Why is it irrelevant? Well, it's, it's not irrelevant, of course, to the business and so forth, and yes, we all want to win one, but, but to be in that room means so much, and when you have to choose between five or ten high-quality films, someone's going to be left out. Sometimes it's a moment in time, and that moment in time is the only time that particular movie would win. And, and uh, that's, if you look at the history of the Academy Awards, you can see when those instances yeah. occurred. Well, <coughs> Jim, you certainly had a big one of those moment in times. Which time? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the time we waited for Sideways to win or the time we waited for Avatar? The time we see. waited for Avatar. But anyway, go ahead. Well, we did it. win the Bank of America Award that year. And so, you know. <laughs> Um, I did offer to trade the award for the economics. <laughs> and, for, yeah. some, for some reason, so uh, it Jim was fine. Passed. You know, it was okay. But I think both points are well taken. That they are, you know, they do um, uh, honor uh, artistic achievement and rec recognize it. And they also put movies on the radar of people who might not otherwise be aware of them. You know, one of my favorite sayings is Sam Goldwyn's, who said. You know, I love this movie. I don't care how much money it makes, as long as every man, woman, and child in America goes to see it. <laughs> and Academy Award nominations or recognition does that. You know, so a movie like The Sessions or a movie even like Hitchcock, which people recognize the name, but what's that about? You know, it becomes our Life of Pi or any of the movies that are nominated and that we're all representing here. You know, how easy do is become, it for you to make those? those I mean, Solberg would. Green Knight a movie just because he felt this movie was a great movie, at least so the myth goes, regardless of knowing that, okay, this movie would not necessarily make money. Right. Is that possible in today's environment? Well, that was a time when 40% of America went to the movies once a week. Right. That, that was the reality in his day. 40% of America went at least once a week. I, I think the process always starts with the material. You, 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 know, you, you fall in love with it. And then you start to do the analysis. OK, will people want to see it? How hard will it be to get them to see it? And what do the economics look like? But you always start with the material. And then once that material has sort of caught you and got you and grabbed you, you do everything you can to figure out how to make it. So it's more of a business about how do we get this done as opposed to let's not do this. As you said, you're finding those scripts that inspire you, that, that you look at and you say, this is an amazing work but then you do have to deal with the reality and the and the business of it and the finances of it and so then it is about how much can you afford to invest in this idea and what is the breakout potential is it and what happens with it if it gets nominated for an oscar and it, is that the only way that it's going to get attention but that is then part of the process of what you're doing so like we have flight that's a movie that ultimately was a very dark script on the page, but then Bob Zemeckis, who's one of the most successful directors of all time, sparked to it. But even with him, we're saying this is the level that we're prepared to do this. Even though it's a script that everybody loved, it was not a straight ahead piece of material. And so on that, even though it's Bob Zemeckis, you're only giving him, in that case, $30 million and saying that's what we're willing to do that. Even though we love the script, we're not now saying because it's Bob Zemeckis in the script, it's $100 million. You're still the reality of saying it has to be perfect execution. Because that is what's complicated about those ideas, is it then it is so much more about the execution. Because there are a lot of other movies we make that at times is about the marketing and getting a big opening weekend. Those movies are about you have to create something special and you hope that you have a script you're inspired by that when you put together the filmmaker and the cast, you then have something that truly is magical. You, you closed down Paramount's uh, specialty division. Is that because you didn't see that as an economically viable uh, form of movie making anymore? I think the one thing that starts to happen when you have separate divisions is there's a sense that there's an amount of output that each division has to have. And I think the way we have approached the studio in general is saying we're not, we're going to have a low overhead, we're not going to be driven by we have to put out 20 movies, or this division to sustain itself has to put out six or eight movies. But saying our group has shown the flexibility that they can release any type of movie, whether that is Paranormal Activity, or whether that was True Grit, or whether it's Transformers, this group of people has shown that diversity in their skill set. So we didn't need to have a separate group because this group has shown the ability to do any of those types of movies. Is there any one film that you've had to turn down that you loved 
because you just felt economically it wasn't normal. And by the way, I, I, I start off as a script reader, and sometimes I read great scripts. And I remember reading, I think, Dennis Potter's script about the woman behind the real Alice in Wonderland. And it was such a wonderful piece of writing. But a script reader says yes, no, or maybe. And it was no, because was, this was not a commercially viable product. It was heartbreaking. Is there any one for you that's been that? Yeah, well, it gets back to the answer I gave you about what I'd be doing, that when the script for Moneyball, at one point it was available. And I had read the book when it first came out, was inspired by the way he'd approached, and it's something that's relevant to us in terms of how do you find the value in things that other people don't. And so it was a very, I found that, that story very inspirational. But then you get to the business of it, and you're saying it is a movie that much of the dialogue is a discussion about baseball and baseball statistics. How is this going to travel even with Brad Pitt as part of it? And then you have the reality of the movie ultimately, Sony ultimately made the movie, the movie got nominated, the movie was a great movie, and ultimately didn't do a lot of business outside of the US. So it was a great movie, and I was happy that it got made and got to see it, but ultimately it was one that you just couldn't find a way to figure out how to make those economics work. I was gonna say, that's why it took Elizabeth Gabler over 10 years and getting Ang Lee on board to finally wear Tom and me down to say yes to pie at a number that would normally scare anyone into making life Which is pie. roughly what? A substantial budget. Donna? <laughs> I, think, I, mean, I think it's evident when you look at a CG tiger that it's not an inexpensive movie. Sorry, how did she persuade you to do that? Just her unbridled passion over a long period of time and bringing on board one of the great directors that's alive today. But it was a, over a very long extended period of time and the fact that Aang had a vision and it's one of those times when you say, okay, well we just have to do this. But it doesn't, it doesn't pencil out. You just decide that that's one of those times when you take a great risk and the other times you hope you can contain it within a searchlight model which mm -hmm usually allows some of those more ambitious, creatively ambitious, specialized movies to work more uh, economically, you know, financially. It's about a combination of passion and the level of risk that the picture can bear, you know? And um, we look at it, we don't look about winning the weekend. <laughs> we don't look, uh, it's, it's not just about the first run, um, of, of a picture. It's really long term. It's the kind of movies we do are the movies that become evergreens. It's something we learned from Arthur Krem in the UA days. This is a different business than the business of opening a weekend on a weekend, trying to win the weekend and dealing with numbers like you're dealing with. I don't know how you sleep at night having those kind of numbers. <laughs> but, but I think the way the business has evolved is the kind of movies where uh, people are taking uh, uh, risks that the bigger companies would never take are the movies where the risks are a lot lower financially. You know, whether it's Slumdog Millionaire, or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or Capote, or Midnight in Paris. You know, those are films that the studios would have made years and years ago, but that's not happening now, for, I think, for financial reasons, but there's another way to do them now. Don, I'm curious about Les Mis. I mean, when you were green lighting that, were you specifically thinking awards or how did you view it? Um, <clears throat> in all honesty, we weren't. Um, we, uh, we love the material. And uh, I know that sounds so pat to say, but we really did love the material. And working title and Cameron Macintosh, I mean, first of all, Les Mis is a, is a piece of material that has taken 27 years to come to the screen. You know, it wasn't the first attempt at, you know, with Cameron teaming up with Working Title. There had been, there had been sort of other goes of it along the way. And, and uh, Cameron, who is just an incredible theater impresario, understands his material inside and out. I mean, it really is, it, you know, he birthed it. So um, instinctively, he waited. He knew that he had to wait until he had the right team around him. And so, when the full package was presented to us and, and, um, and uh, you know, I was involved with working title in persuading Tom Hooper to come on board and, and direct the movie after winning the Academy Award for, for King's Speech, it just all sort of made sense to us. But the thing that actually spoke to us more than anything about it, I mean, it's, it is that it was a way, it, it, we actually, from a business perspective, we actually looked at it as 
as almost a tentpole film. Yeah. It's not priced like a tentpole film. It's actually priced very responsibly. But in terms of um, the sort of the the um, the IP value of it, you know, this is a show that's played for 27 years in 50 countries around the world and and has had, you know, hundreds of millions of of, uh, of uh, viewers. And so the idea that we could sort of eventize it by casting it the way that it, you know, that we cast it, and uh, and and Tom's vision, directorial vision for it, um, you know, just again sort of made us believe that we could present it as a real event, particularly in the holiday season. And yeah. Why do you think the Hurt Locker, even with an Academy Award, didn't do better financially? America at that time, and probably still today, is is not. Um, ready to view uh, the conflicts that we're involved in as entertainment. Um, it's not something they want to sort of take that moment when they go to the theater to try to be in that darkened environment and, <clears throat> and enjoy themselves, sort of suspend their daily lives and, and be captivated by the big screen. And we knew that when we, uh, when we acquired it. Uh, it. To me, it was always about this amazing film and about the heroes that it was portraying. And we did everything we could to try to eliminate the, the sort of backdrop, which of course it's hard to do, but, but to try to position it as a heroic telling of what Americans do every day, whether they're firemen or whether they're police officers. In this particular case, they were bomb disposal units. So that was the approach when I saw the film um, that I wanted to take and that we all, you know, embraced and uh, amazing filmmaking. I mean, that, that um, um, we couldn't uh, disregard. So uh, we, we always knew it was going to be an economic challenge. Um, I mean, the movie has done enormous business in the home end market. I mean, enormous. Um, but you were talking right from the beginning about what's the, how do you market it right when you Right, as, as I was watching it. I mean, you know, my, my background is I came up through the marketing process. So, you know, it's sometimes, I like to go to movies multiple times because in my subsequent viewings, I actually watch them as a moviegoer. Uh, I try not to do the analytical part. So, um, so as I was watching the movie, I was obviously captivated and then the challenge of it uh, was ever present. And when the lights came up, we said, I, I had a very, very specific view of what I thought uh, we could do with that movie, and um, and we that's when we acquired it immediately. So, so you know that year it, I was <coughs> backstage at the Oscars that year, and it's mainly international press and more commercial press, not trade. And when the Hurt Locker, when it was announced that the Hurt Locker won over Avatar, I mean people just like gasped out loud. It mm -hmm. was like they couldn't, you know, I don't because they weren't on the inside of this business, they couldn't understand how that film would have beat Avatar. I mean, do you, do you think there is a bias towards more commercial films during award season in favor of what's seen as more art house films? Again, the, the, the way the process works, you know, that's the great thing. Um, you know, it's that we, we all sort of live and die by the process of the voting of the Academy members. And the, and the great news about Academy members is they get to choose of their selections based on their own personal views, whether they're coming from a technical background, a creative background, a performing background. Um, so they, they basically get to choose. And that calculation, you know, sometimes works. I mean, I, Chariots of Fire, the year Chariots of Fire won. Everybody said, oh my God, how, how did that win? How did that win? Driving Miss Daisy. I mean, so inevitably there are times when those things occur because the, the craft uh, is what's being rewarded, not the economics of what's being rewarded. And that's just, that happens to be the way the Academy process works. Commerce is not part of the Academy's equation when they yeah. vote. How did you feel when Saving Private Ryan lost? Because I, I, that was a shocker. Uh, did you take those things very personally? And uh, Yeah, how do you not? I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it is, uh, and you know, I, I, it's, it's very hard. Shakespeare in Love's a wonderful movie. But just for me as, you know, someone who's grown up in movies, you know, I remember going and, you know, seeing Spartacus as a kid on Broadway in a big movie, you know. Private Ryan, you know, to me is like one of the great movies of all time and will stand the test of time. And so, how that happens, you know, uh, it's always been 
a mystery to me. It's one That's of the very... one I'd like to see the vote on. It might have been one vote. You don't know. <laughs> what did you do afterwards? Did you just like go home? Do you? How do you get over that? Do you just? You do. You know. I mean, it's not. You know. I think we. You know. Uh, there was a. How long? When you lose, you move on. Um, how long does it take to move on, though? Like that gut feeling in your gut. Well, I'm still disappointed. So, I mean, as you were having these conversations, literally, I'm replaying, <laughs> sitting there in that theater that night, in that moment, and it is though it were, as though it was yesterday. It's one of those Hammers things. Backstage with that, I was know. backstage at the same time, run, and I was writing the lead of the story. Yeah. Spielberg had won Best Director. <laughs> it was obvious Ryan was going to win Best Picture, and I'm starting to write the lead. And on the television, I kind of vaguely see somebody else coming up. But that was, but, but don't you think in some fashion, that was when a new kind of campaigning came on the scene, right? Or at least a new, a new era of Oscar campaigning. I mean, am I wrong about that? Well, that no, you're right. I mean, it's one of the things that, you know, again, most of these executives here have, uh, you know, been in business with Steven Spielberg over the years. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've always respected enormously about Steven, uh, even in, in our DreamWorks days, is, is that there's no such thing as campaigning. You just won't. Oh my God, it is like, forget it, I don't do this, it's not, that's not what the Academy is about, right. you know, I don't believe in it, and it, I mean, and I'm sure to the frustrations of, of people here, and by the way, to my frustration, because at the time, he forbid us. From doing cocktail parties or? Anything. Literally, he would not allow, you know, I mean, Terry Press, who was as good at this as anybody, she was shackled, tape, duct tape over the mouth. <laughs> and, I mean, do you think it has become a little bit frustrating what you have to go through now? I'm a little bit on Mr. Spielberg's side. I think you have to spend on an Academy campaign to get the Academy members to see the film. But I don't think they're influenced beyond that. The most important thing is well, to get them to see the film. Well, unfortunately, it's not true. I mean, honestly, that, that is no longer the case. I wish it were that. Yeah. But it's, it's sort of like legislating campaign reform in the political arena. You know, unless everybody plays by rules and, and agrees to them, it's not going to stop. And the Academy, and we're both members of the board, <clears throat> The Academy tries to put some lids on what people can do and some of the practices that have gotten out of hand. But do they but work? people have, it is a political process. I mean, and they if it was left unbridled, it would be really... What do you think, what do you think we would see? Oh, I mean, it would go nuts. It would go nuts. <laughs> but there are two pieces to it, as you said earlier. Part of it is the nomination. And I do think the, the key is, that is where the exposure and people viewing... I think when we look at it, there's not a lot of times where you feel like a movie got nominated that shouldn't got nominated or right. didn't get nominated because of spending. But I do think then when you're down to getting votes and you're talking about a moment in time where somebody is focused on what they're voting on, how you became top of mind for someone is very relevant in that particular moment when you got your ballot and you marked it. Because now it's a very specific moment in time versus it is a season in terms of the, the nomination process, in terms of getting screeners and going to screenings. There's a, a lot of time where people are, I think by and large, making a very honest assessment of the movies and how they respond to them over the course of a three, four month period. But it is that dynamic of you now are at, at one moment in time, you're going to mark a ballot and what is it that you suddenly had in front of you and why were you reminded and what had you done three days before is gonna matter as you go to mark that box. And so that is where I think the actual voting process is where that really becomes an issue, where money can matter, because you suddenly got 22 impressions of a movie over a four day period as you went to vote. It is the equivalent of opening a movie in terms of the dynamic of the voting and the timing of the voting versus the rest of it, which is a much slower, more, I think, yeah. much more thoughtful process. I'm really glad there's so much limitation on this stuff. And if it was unbridled, it would be horrible. I don't know to what extent that would irritate most Academy members if it was unbridled. I'm just, what I see in the spend is way too much. I, I think when I see an outrageous spend and someone wins the award, that they could have spent half that and still won that award. People were talking about that film winning two or three months before. I'm not talking about the year of, of Shakespeare in Love and Saving Pride and Ryan, but in the last few years. But I think I'm, the spending's I'm, so out of hand. I mean, but Michael, you, you as a practice spend less. 
Okay. Yes. We, when I moved from the studio world to the independent world, we as a practice spend less. We have less to spend. Yeah. Uh, and we still capture an you equal still number won of the nominations. best picture is yeah. my point. Yeah. So, so I agree. The level of spending clearly, and, and I would think that if you look at the numbers today versus three years ago, they're down. You think yeah. they are low? Yeah, yeah, definitely. They are. They're, yeah. There's no question about it. The wallpaper is, low, is lower. There's no question really? about it. Yeah. You know, we as Academy members are trying to eliminate the paper. Yeah. Uh, we all get mail, you know, stacks and stacks of, you know, Screening invites, you know, this, that, and the other. That, you know, not only is it killing all these trees, but it in inevitably ends up not even being read. So there are a lot of things that we, as Academy board members and as Academy members, are trying to sort of minimize because we do believe that it's wasteful and, and is not serving a purpose. But on the other hand, the thing that we all try to do on the other side, not being an Academy member, but being a studio executive, is we try to get them to see our movies. Because inevitably, there's such a, a large number of contenders, um, all you know, tr vying for a very limited amount of time. Right. So that is sort of the, the yin and the yang of it, trying to get them to see your movie. Because ultimately, the movie is what's going to dictate their vote. But, but my point is, I think there are creative ways to get those nominations or, you know, I, I don't spend outrageous amounts of money, Tom and I don't, but we still think there's a shot for Emmanuel Riva and Jean-Louis Trittignan to be actor and actress, or Matthias Schoenart or Marion Cotillard to be actor and actress, and it's not going to be about the spend if right. they get in there, you know. But a lot of the spend ultimately is political and the pressure comes from the filmmakers and the talent that they start to, that it starts to ratchet up because they see what somebody else is doing and they're saying, why are you not doing that for my movie? So but you don't do you have that in the contracts too, where, where <coughs> you have to launch a campaign for them? Don't know if you're doing one of those No. Things. No, mm -hmm. it no, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really is about, I mean, in terms of Rob's point there and you know, whether you do sort of, va you know, quote unquote, vanity campaigns, I, you can't really look at it like that. We're all in, you know, sustained relationships with filmmakers, you know, and part of the relationship is, you know, part of the sort of the, the you know, the contract is to, is to sort of honor their work, you know, and if they have, if they've, if they've done something that, um, you know, deserves to be at least considered as part of the conversation, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it is the right thing to do to responsibly support that, I think. I'm curious, you have filmed, I, I love this award season, The Impossible, and it's been a bit under the radar. What was your thinking in moving ahead? Was it an acquisition? Was it something you developed? No, no, we produced it. It's not under the radar. It's the biggest movie in Spain as we speak. Okay. <laughs> it's it. It, it and, opened and last night. How, you, how do you... Uh, how no, do no, you we, we, we uh, uh, produced that along with Telecinco, and, and uh, it is a movie that is near and dear to our heart. The reason why it's a little under the radar is because we don't want to peak too soon. Mm -hmm. The movie comes out in December officially. And we should tell um, people what it's about, because it's about, it's based on a real life story of, uh, I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's real life, a real life family caught up in the tsunami. Correct. And the tsunami in Thailand, is yeah. extraordinary right. in it. You just think you're in the tsunami, and Naomi Watts gives an amazing performance. And, I mean, but it has, you've got a title that's unusual. I wonder if you thought, well, this isn't the right title for the film. How are we going to market this? What was your thinking in terms of how, how are you going to open that film? How are you going to play it? How are you going to uh, get awards support for it? Uh, doing, uh, by having people like you say what they just said <laughs> <laughs> in large and larger and larger environments. Um, it's the reason why we took it to Toronto. Um, it's the reason why it was at San Sebastian and the reason why it's opening in Spain. Uh, Juan Antonio Bayona, the, the filmmaker, um, has done an extraordinary job, and uh, it is based on a, on a true family's, um, 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 I don't want to call it an adventure because it was, it was not a chosen adventure, but um, this family, the Spanish family that survived the, the, um, the tsunami. And it's an extraordinary movie, which we are continuing to bring slowly, but methodically, to the attention of the, the movie going public. You know, awards are important to it, like a, a, another wonderful movie we have called The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which when we bought the material, we always knew was going to be a challenge. 
um, uh, from an economics perspective. But you know, when you when you read the material and now when you see the movie, you realize that we've all sort of we all have that same life experience, and it's about how do we communicate the the you know the sort of good feeling that we have when we view this movie and we view the result of this movie. Thank you. It's. Um, I mean, um, Rob, you know, with The Impossible, I mean, all of you can probably speak to this. You know, isn't it true that you're saying it's doing really well in Spain, that the awards now actually do make a movie, like it helps in the international run, too? I mean, is that a fair... Yeah, listen, when you look at movies, especially movies that you know have more of, a, of an intellectual approach to right. them, um, as opposed to a, you know, sort of more overt entertainment marketing uh, uh, value to them. You always think of awards as part of your marketing campaign. Right. It, you have to. It's, right. it's part of the equation that you factor in. Um, it's a little bit about wishful thinking, though, because it requires, you know, I mean, it was said earlier that the, the process of making a movie is an extraordinary process. I, it amazes me every time I see a good movie because so many hands touch it at so many points in its life. Um, there are so many, it's a puzzle that you hope comes together and part of that process when you're starting with the material is and it's going to get great reviews and it's going to get award recognition and that's this thing you say when you're going, when you're putting it in the level of okay this is how we're going to achieve success. Right. Now you're saying that in the very very beginning of a process so it's sort of wishful thinking that you hope you've put all the elements together to achieve that level of success, which is part of your marketing campaign. It's either that or you hire Brad Pitt. So, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so, um, and when it comes together, it's something that's extraordinary. And, and we're, those we're, are the we're in a business where, oh, sorry, Jim, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say to Pam's point that one of the other opportunities of the award season is one of the biggest movie going periods internationally is the winter period, January and February. And so for a film like Lincoln, which we have internationally, which is a brilliant film, but a film that um, does need that lift. Now it has Steven Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis, right. so but that sort of helps. The but the content and the nature of the film, the subject matter, um, needs the, is enormously aided by the right. fact that it will, we hope, be recognized in award season and then plays out in January. So that and other films that um, do get awards recognition have that window right. internationally to play in through that awards period and then have that awareness. So right. it's a great... You, you look at the landscape now and it's sort of sim been similar. You know, we have DVDs, they go out, there are screeners, there are movie theaters. Just broadening from this to what you're looking at in a way, Jeffrey, ten, in 10 years' time, where is the industry going to be? Oh, he loves this question. You know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're dealing with issues that sort of Pam and I have been discussing and all of us over many years. And yet there are gigantic changes going on. Are we going to even... Yeah, they haven't even begun. Yeah. Really? Well, so what, what tell us. I think that uh, 10 years from now, um, al almost everything changes. All the stakeholders are going to be re rearranged on the, on the, well, because I think that movies um, are only growing in their popularity. And I think that the power of this is going to more than just simply transform the consumption of movies. I think it's going to revolu revolutionize them. And I think that, you know, today we talk about a, a big blockbuster film today, if you sort of look at it on a macro level, about 100 million people will see a movie and pay on a blended basis about $10. So between, and I'm not talking about the biggest movies, but just you know the sort of big 100 to 200 million dollar grossing movies. Um, and you know some of them will see it in a movie theater or an IMAX, and some will buy a DVD, and some will get it at you know Redbox for a dollar. But if you just sort of blend it across that, ten years from now, two billion people will pay a dollar fifty. Some people will watch it for sixty-five cents on this. Some watch it for two dollars on a TV screen. Some will go to you know state-of-the-art theaters where you'll have a meal and a great whole experience there and they'll pay $50 for it. But it all changes. And, and, uh, and I, as I say, I think every stakeholder is going to win and lose in that, in that, you know, everyone today 
there are going to be great wins and great losses in that. But the business is going to go through a, a radical transformation that will not look like what it looks like today. Now, I don't know whether that's 10 years or 15 years, but Does that it mean, is coming. Does that mean fewer and fewer people will actually go to the movie theater? No, just the opposite. It's like sports. Look at sports today. Sports has never been more popular than it is today. If you want to take the analogy, is, is you go back and 20 years ago, if, well, it's actually true of today, if you lived in Los Angeles and you wanted to see the Lakers, you actually have to go to a Laker game because they would black it out. Well, we actually have that moment in time again here, but <laughs> but <laughs> just, just as a moment, it's just a fluke. But I'm saying the Yankees, when I grew up in New York, when the Yankees played a home game in this, you couldn't see it on television because there was this notion that to fill a stadium of 50,000 people, that's a different experience than watching it at home, you couldn't have it for free. Well, it's just not true. And so in the same way that sports has been completely transformed, Formed and now is a very broad, highly popularized, in which you can experience it on so many different levels, you know, and price points accordingly along the, the, the way for it in it. And that's what will happen to us. But why do you think that happen, hasn't happened with the music business? Why do I think it hasn't? Well, because I think at the moment, I think the music business did the opposite of, uh, of, of what we've done in the movie business, which is um, I think they... I think greed got the better of them. I think Seriously, also, I think that. Well, go on, Jim. I think. I think yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I think also they have a very different model. Um, first thing that happened was one day there wasn't Napster, the next day the cataclysm was there. And so it com got them completely off guard. Jeffrey's right, they were greedy. And so every time that the sales of CDs went down, they took the price up. And because customers you know, realized that that just didn't seem right. Um, and apart from that, their business model is different in the sense that their first exposure of their creative content is free. It's on the radio. Mm -hmm. Our first exposure is in right. the best setting possible so at from a the highest price. From a psychology perspective, from the consumer, the consumer always felt they were getting it for free. Anyway. And, they, and they priced their business out, which is they eliminated a singles business. Rather than making their product more accessible at many different price points, which the movie business has done, the fact is you can get a movie for a dollar today. Or you can go to you know, a gold-class cinema and see a movie for $45 and have a first-class meal. There's and the other, thing, the other thing just is, is we as an industry were in the process of deciding how we were going to bring our product to this new technology. And we saw this train wreck. And so we were able to observe this train wreck. And it's, we said to ourselves, hold on a second. We've got to, let's take a beat. Let's just not make our product available so quickly in this format until we have more protection. And we took a long time before we allowed our product to be released on d DVDs. Mm -hmm. Back to this is always a fun question for me, not so fun for you guys. I mean, do well, you- Well, maybe we won't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> huh, how about that? Uh, we haven't, no one's talked about it publicly in a long time, but what's happening with, pr with premium VOD and successfully shortening the window <clears throat> without like inflaming the theater owners? It's We've been having ongoing conversations with theater owners, and they're starting to come around that it is analogous to, well, it's, a, it's exactly what Jeffrey was talking about, analogous to the sports experience. Here's the simple concept, and they're starting to understand it. They just don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. The average life of a movie in a multiplex is three and a half weeks. The video window is about four months. Right. So you have three months of darkness. We call it the dark zone because they understand that very simple concept. Three months at the time when consumers, when audiences know the most about a movie when there's no place to get it. So that doesn't mean that they don't get it. That means they either resort to piracy or they stay home and watch something else if that's the movie they want to see. So how do you do something about that? We started that process by moving the digital window, the availability of a digital download up a little bit, but that was a small right. step in that direction. We're hoping that uh, we can gradually get theaters around to that idea, but so far they've been very strident in this, you know, very The one thing that helps approach. us is that they actually know, these guys, that for every single person sitting around this table today, the movie going experience is the single most important thing for us. It's what we all strive for, it's what we work to, it's we produce our movies to be seen in that 
premium, best format. We want our audiences, we want our movies experience. They're made for audiences. Right. You know, and so there's not a single person here that given the choice of saying, would you prefer to have your movie seen in a great movie theater or, you know, on your iPhone? It's like a non-starter. And I think exhibition does understand that that is where our heart and our passion is. It's how do you protect the business? You know, they're entitled to, you know, that's, that's, what, that's the yin and yang that's going on here. That's where the stress point is on it. But by the way, there, there is nobody that owns a world-class stadium today that is not doing significantly better today than they were doing 20 years ago. No one. By the way, more people, higher price points, you know, more merchandise, better food, better parking, you name it. Every single aspect of it, people that, are, that used to be a, you know, a, a questionable business, stadium business, we're about to build a stadium here in Los Angeles, finally. Yeah. Why? Well, it's good business. It's good business. I mean, we, I mean we, 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 as Jim said, we, we constantly talking with our exhibition partners right. about these things. We, we have with our company, Roadside, you know, a model that is sort of a, a day and date model with theatrical and, right. and video on demand, which has worked very, very successfully. With just, we just did it with arbitrage. Um, and, and you can see on a theater by theater basis that the box office is not being negatively affected. Mm -mm. And the performance in the VOD uh, uh, market is, is performing extraordinarily well. I was one of those people. So, so it's, <laughs> as Jeffrey says, people want to consume when they can in different ways. So it really is an educational process that we're working with our partners on the exhibition side to, so that everybody wins. This yeah. is not about trying to, you don't want to hurt a 10, 11 billion dollar window, which is currently the theatrical window. Nobody wants to do that, it's too important. So it's really about trying to figure out how we make it available on all levels and not hurt any of the opportunities. Well, Rob, I just, to Rob Friedman, I want to ask, I know Paramount's been sort of on the other side of this debate. I mean, what's, what do you think about shortening the window? Well, I think, as we talked about, that the theatrical experience to us is the most important one. And I think continuing to have exhibition invest in better sound and better quality and better screens. And we've been very aggressive in partnering with IMAX that our goal is to have people see it in that the first exhibition is the best and that's the one that then is going to create the word of mouth. But we are dealing with a generation of kids who are growing up and I have three teenage sons who are now in a place where they expect to be able to watch things when they want them on a whatever device and they are oddly comfortable, as Jeffrey said, <laughs> watching a movie on their iPhone um, as they are watching something on a big screen and they view them as not exclusive experiences, but they are different experiences. There are times when they want to go with a group of people out to a movie theater, and there are times where they're hanging out and want to spend 20 minutes watching something on their phone. And I think there is this generational shift that's going on, and exhibition has had a hard time with it. As Jeffrey said, sports, it wasn't as if sports went there overnight. It took a while. There were a lot of teams that weren't willing to put their home games on television, and then you started to see. So I think some of these things, as, as Rob talked to, as they are part of these experiments that they see their theaters surviving and movies working that are smaller movies while they're available on VOD, it is part of an educational experience for them as well to see, oh, okay, this can actually work and it can increase interest in movies and increase people coming to a movie theater. But that is definitely going to take some amount of time for them because they've lived an entire life where it was done where they had the window exclusively. Two quick questions, then we have to wrap up. Just firstly, globalization, which, well, you're all very aware of with the films you're doing. Uh, America's dominated the film industry, you know, since the, pretty much the silent era. Is that going to change with the growth of China? Are we going to end up in a situation where America isn't a huge export industry for films? but it actually starts becoming an import industry. Well, fortunately, one of the best resources that this country and fortunately this town has is still the best group of storytellers. And that continues to be one of our country's strengths and our industry's strength. And I think that will continue for as long as we can right now because fortunately for us, we do tell the stories that are the most global and the most universal. And so I think that is the one big yeah. advantage we have long term. Jeffrey, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's cultural. I think, mm -hmm. I think people, 
This is where it actually, growing up in a totally free society, one in which we celebrate expression, personal expression, creative expression, artistic expression, through our schools, through our education, through our colleges, through every aspect of our life. We, we are the freest and most open society in the world. And by the way, in Southern California is the sort of center of that, even for our own country. And it's not an accident that out of that DNA comes creativity, comes artistry, comes storytelling. You know, that has existed in the rest of the world. And so from time to time, we see great filmmakers coming from the UK. We see great filmmakers coming from, you know, France, from Australia, from different parts of the world. And that will happen. It'll, all, it'll continue to happen. You know, you, you, you know, Ang Lee, you know, in other words, it can. But if you want to just, those unfortunately have tended to be more the accidents than you know, uh, uh, the day-to-day -day flow of, of, of talent from other parts of the world, whereas here, it's every day, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids just pouring into this world with that uh, freedom of, 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 of expression and creativity. It does not exist anywhere else. That's th the nature of the American culture is multicultural, yeah. and that's yes. what makes it so distinctive. Mm -hmm. The American, um, the American movie industry from its birth was selling movies, was making movies for an audience which was Germans and Hungarians and Chinese and people from all over the world. So by so, its nature, it was multicultural. America's second greatest export has been and continues right. to be movies and television. Right. And we are one of its greatest employers. It is one of the true backbones economically uh, and creatively, and it, it, it is our ambassador. It actually talks to the rest of the world. It's more important than politicians. We make movies about baseball. But we don't cannot trend. lose sight of the fact that so many of this, these new stories and the storytelling are influenced by international stories right. and a lot That's of these. Right. I mean, when we did Crouching Tiger, that kind of storytelling was influenced. I see so many films on television cut just, like, <laughs> cut, <laughs> cut just like Run, Lola, Run. You know, um, uh, you go all the way back to Godard, Breathless. The fact of the matter is, I think the Hollywood storytelling has become much richer because in recent years there's been a great influence from all of these different cultures. And it's coming now from new and different places. We have a film from Saudi Arabia coming from a woman that will knock you out. We have, Although we have a movie this from happened Afghanistan. In, in, and in that, the twenties, yeah. and it also happened with the flight from the Nazis in the first. Very last question and we have to wrap. On the personal level, one film that really means some that you, I don't mean one you've made, I mean one movie that you would okay, take with you. Here's the problem with that question. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to answer the same movie. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I, that was surprising. Yeah, yeah. So you go first. What would your movie be? Lawrence of Arabia. Probably the most influential film for me, because so it's, not, it's not necessarily my favorite film, but it was the most influential film was The Red Shoes. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. I it, it's I don't know. It's so trite. Choose <laughs> one. I'd say that I, I, you know, I, I'd still, I'd have to, I have to, I know, I just. You can do it. Just, I'd, I'd still go back to the second Godfather. I just think oh, it was just. Okay. I mean, <laughs> but exactly. no, but it's ever. I, I thought that's what Jeffrey was going to say because it's also Lawrence of Arabia. But I thought, I, I thought that was where he was going to go. And and. Uh, Rob Friedman. Well, it influenced me. I mean, as a kid, uh, I lived in an extraordinarily small town, and the, the film that I remember most vividly is Ten Commandments. We got out of school, and we went, and they took us, and we watched it. Rob Moore. See, mine is The Godfather, so Jeffrey was right. At least Jim and I are on this. <laughs> the first Godfather? Mine actually was the first Godfather. Okay. And Michael. finding Michael. I'm just older than all of you, that's all. Um, I think Rear Window is it. And it tells us what we do, why we do, as a viewer, as a practitioner, as a storyteller. The because you, you restored it. The Passenger was very moving because we restored it and finally talked Jack Nicholson into selling it to us after 10 years. And 
restored it to the version that Antonioni really loved. I do love the passenger. But I think rear window kind of says it all for us, you know. Mm -hmm.